Let's say a prayer before we start our study. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace you've given us. And I pray as we study tonight, you would teach us what you are doing today, what you were doing then, and what is the difference. Uh, we know you're not the author of confusion. We know there's a lot of confusion about this chapter. So please help us to come to knowledge of the truth regarding that. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Acts chapter 2. If you recall, last week we started with the first four verses and dealt in detail with what was going on here. We already dealt in chapter 1 about uh, the Lord teaching the 12 apostles about the kingdom come for 40 days. Uh, him telling them about the coming baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was promised by the prophets and promised by the Father and promised by Jesus in his earthly ministry. And so that's what was going to happen in chapter 2. Uh, we also saw, based on prophecy, Peter replacing Judas. As the prophecies said, uh, there would be one that would betray the Lord, betray the Messiah. Judas fulfills those prophecies. And so Peter, uh, understanding that, uh, says we need to replace his office. And so they chose a twelfth man by prayer and by uh, the casting of lots at the end of chapter 1. And of course we saw the purpose for that is because there needed to be 12 apostles. Why? Why? Because there are 12 tribes of Israel, and Jesus chose 12, according to Matthew 19.28, to sit on 12 thrones in the kingdom. If you don't have 12 guys sitting on those 12 thrones, the kingdom cannot come, the kingdom cannot uh, be offered to Israel. And so the beginning of Acts here, that's exactly what's going on. The Holy Ghost is going to be poured out, and these 12 men are going to then preach the coming kingdom to the 12 tribes of Israel as the authorities that Christ has set up okay, for that kingdom. That's why there needed to be 12. So there couldn't be just 11, there had to be 12. Judas was the betrayer, fulfilling the prophecy, so they replaced him with Matthias. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, in Acts 2 verse 1, uh, Pentecost being a Jewish feast day, we saw last week, that's a fulfillment of all of the Pentecost that had been practiced by Israel since Exodus. And there was a reason for those feast days. We saw the fulfillment of Passover, unleavened bread, and the feast of uh, uh, first fruits in Jesus' death and resurrection. And here we see the, the fulfillment of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon this kingdom Israel here, upon this group of, of Jews going to the kingdom. We, we described the detail about that with the rushing mighty wind in verse 2. The sound, which was the first evidence the Holy Spirit had come, was the sound. Okay? We saw the rushing mighty wind. We saw the, it filled the house where they were sitting. We saw in verse 3 the cloven tongues like as of fire. We covered how that was not the baptism of fire that John the Baptist talked about. We went back to prophecy and saw how prophecy detailed the fire baptism. And John himself described the fire baptism being one of judgment not one of the Holy Ghost. So here we just simply have the tongues like as a fire sitting upon each of these, uh, these gentlemen here. And it says in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now at this point, I want to review briefly this Holy Ghost issue because last week we dealt with it. I know there's some questions with it that came up. I want to make sure we're on the same page on this Holy Ghost uh, and what's going on here. Okay, uh, We've already covered that it, this is not the first time the Holy Ghost shows up in the Bible. Okay, A lot of folks just don't... don't know that. They think this is the first time the Holy Ghost shows up at Pentecost. That's just simply not true. In the very first verses of the Bible in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God is uh, on the face of the waters back there. Okay? And all throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord comes on certain anointed ones. The difference between what was going on before when the Spirit came upon one and another one is that here the Spirit is coming on all of them. This is they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So there was no distinction among the believers here of who had the Holy Spirit and who didn't. They all were filled with it. Okay? Um, in the Old Testament, uh, the Holy Ghost would, uh, would, would in, in our Bible, would often come upon people with power. And so the Holy Spirit has this association with power. If we could just real briefly cover some of these passages, look at Judges 15. Judges 15. In order to understand what's going on in the book of Acts, which is a book of transition from Israel's program to what God's doing today, uh, we have to understand Israel's program and part of their program in time passes in Judges where God supernaturally created the nation of Israel, supernaturally protected the nation of Israel, and supernaturally gave them power that other nations did not. And part of that is the Judges. Back here, read the book of Judges. He identified certain people who would be the saviors of Israel back in the book of Judges. And one of those people was Samson. Uh, in Judges 15, 14, uh, it says, When he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord 
came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire. And so he broke the handcuffs, is, is what the verse is saying there. But notice here, in the, in the next verse, of course, is where he slays a thousand men with a jawbone and that sort of thing. So the strength of the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. That's how he got his strength. And it says in verse 14 here, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. That's the, the same language you see in Acts 2, where it says the rushing mighty wind came, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and there's this power that they exhibit. Not just the power to speak in tongues, which we'll cover later tonight, but we'll see uh, later in the next chapter, uh, power to heal, okay? Power to do things, power to know things. The Holy Spirit in power was something that's associated with Israel and the earthly kingdom, okay? Um, let's look at it again in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Turn to the right, the next book there, the next couple books, 1 Samuel chapter 10. When the first kings were set up in Israel, the kings were anointed with power. That's how they were identified. And so Samuel, the prophet of God, whom God spoke through, uh, when he came to identify Saul, explained to Saul that he would know, that Saul would know that he was the anointed king when the Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. In 1 Samuel 10, verse 10, when they came there up to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, the him there is Saul, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And so here you see Saul in the Old Testament, the Spirit coming upon him, and he prophesies. Right? So knowing some of these instances, Genesis 41, 38, Joseph, it says the Spirit of the Lord is in him. In Genesis 41, 38, Joseph, of course, had the power to interpret dreams. And of course, he attributed that to God, power in him, not him doing that. Okay, so you see this over and over again. Look at 1 Samuel chapter uh, 16, verse 13. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon someone and anointed them, it was for them to do God's uh, work. It was for them to be a part of God's purpose to, to, to help Israel fulfill his, his plan for them. In 1 Samuel 16, um, also when those people, those anointed ones, did contrary to the Lord's will, disobeyed God, sinned against God, the Holy Spirit would then leave them. So the Holy Spirit would come upon them and anoint them. And then in the case of Saul here, we see an example where he disobeyed God. Remember, Samuel rebuked him. You know the story about how he didn't obey the Lord's instructions. And Samuel said that uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. And as a result of this, in chapter 16, verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him, and, and the him here is David, in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so Samuel anoints David. And so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. In verse 14, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And so we have the Spirit of the Lord coming upon David, and the Spirit of the Lord leaving Saul, right? And why did he leave Saul? Because of his disobedience. Right. In Psalm 51, David also sinned against the Lord. You recall his adultery and his murder, which was, uh, it seems to be a little higher crime than just uh, trying to offer sacrifice to God. But in Psalm 51, uh, verse 11, after his sins, David prays to God, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Okay. Psalm 51, verse 11, because he knew that when he sinned, the Holy Spirit would leave right? The Holy Spirit could leave. He came upon them like a blanket and anointed them with power, and it could leave them when they disobeyed God. Yeah. Psalm 51, verse 11, cast, not away from, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You see that? And so we have this, this activity of the Holy Spirit who comes upon those whom God chooses to do his will, and then leaves those who disobey him. Okay? Now, I'm bringing this up to show two things. One, the Holy Ghost has worked before Pentecost in Acts 2. And so it's not some brand new thing we're saying that the Holy Ghost comes on people and they have power. He's done it before and they've had power. What's unique at Pentecost, he's coming on all the believers, not just one, one man there. The Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 3. Right? But in Acts 2, all of them are baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay? But secondly, to show that in the Old Testament, in Israel's operation, under their covenant which was a contract with God that if they do right, then they'll be blessed, and if they do wrong, they'll be cursed. In that system of operation, the Holy Spirit would leave people when they broke God's will, broke his covenant. Okay? Uh, you, however, that's not how the Holy Spirit operates in us today. Okay? And we need to understand that dispensational difference. Okay? Um, just like we ask the question when we say, well, we preach the gospel. Well, you know, as students who rightly divide the scriptures, to ask, well, which gospel are you talking about? It is totally insufficient to say we preach the gospel and just leave it at that. 
Well, which gospel? Because there are many gospels in the Bible. There are many messages God has given to men to preach as good news, and they concern different things. And so, you know, Christians across the world would say, we all preach the gospel, and yet they preach different things. Okay, Jesus in Mark 1.14 preached the gospel of the kingdom in Mark 1.14, which he describes as, as preaching the fulfillment of the prophesied and promised kingdom to Israel. He says the time is at hand, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. That's the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom is at hand. That's very different than the gospel of the grace of God, which here's good news, that even though you can't do you can't do what is necessary to be saved. You can't do what is necessary to prove your own righteousness. God in his grace is giving you salvation freely by his grace through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of the preaching of the cross, the gospel of the grace of God. Different message than that the kingdom is at hand. You see that? Also different than the gospel of the circumcision. And, and again, I'm not making up these, these terms. These are from the scripture, Mark 1, 14, the gospel of the kingdom. Acts 20, 28, the gospel of the grace of God. Galatians 2, verse 7, the gospel of the circumcision, right? So th these are phrases the Bible uses, and we need to, uh, to, to separate these distinguishing names because of the content. The gospel of circumcision is that God, starting with Abraham, would bless the world through Abraham and his seed, the circumcised people. The circumcision being Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel were the circumcised people. So God had a purpose to bless the world, the earth, through them, right? The, the opposite of the gospel of the circumcision would be the gospel of the uncircumcision, which is how today God's blessing the world or s offering salvation to a world no matter if they're circumcised or not. In fact, salvation now is being preached to, to all men on command of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not Israel is saved or not. In fact, it's without Israel. It's without the law. Okay, it's by grace, not the law. And it's without covenants. Okay. All the covenants that God had made with Israel had been broken, you see. We are not saved by being a part of a covenant. We're not saved by being part of circumcision. We're not saved through Israel. We're not saved under the law. We are saved purely based on the grace of God that he provided for us on the cross of Christ through Jesus Christ. That's our gospel. And it's so important because you don't find that in the Old Testament. You don't find that gospel being preached in Mark chapter 1 verse 14. And we'll see this week, uh, this week and the next week, you don't see that gospel being preached in Acts chapter 2. You just don't. It is not there. The gospel there being preached is the gospel of salvation through Israel and through what the prophets foretold and through what God had covenanted with them. Okay? So how does this refer to the Holy Spirit? Well, just as we ask which gospel in the Bible, we have to make that distinguishment, that right division. When we see the Spirit, we can't just say, oh, there's the Spirit. He does the same thing and the same ministry all throughout the Bible. He doesn't. Okay, he doesn't. Just like we can't say God does the same thing throughout the Bible. A lot of folks, and, and let me just be clear here, okay, a lot of Pentecostal teachers love to quote Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? The verse does not say Jesus Christ does and preaches the same thing yesterday, today, and forever. It's that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not lie. What he says he will do, he will do because he's a God who cannot lie, Numbers 23 says. Okay? Okay. But it's not true that in the Old Testament, Jesus was manifest in the flesh because he was not. Okay? He was manifest in the flesh with the Virgin Mary. Right? So obviously, Jesus, before Mary, wasn't, didn't have manifestation in the flesh, and with Mary he did. Okay? But it was the same second person of the Godhead. You see? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same nature, being God. I bring that up just to point out that, that we can't say about the Spirit or about God that God's doing the same thing at all times. We should know, and, and, and even the Pentecostals would teach, that in the Old Testament, God did something very different than what he's doing now and what they would say in the New Testament. God's doing something different. He was working through Israel then, working through the church now. Well, this is a very simple division, but it's necessary to understand that we can't just say God does the same thing and acts the same way to everybody. He doesn't. He made covenants with Israel. He made no covenant with the church. He made no covenant with Gentiles. Okay? God promised Israel an earthly kingdom. He made no promise of any earthly possession to the church. None. He made you a promise of a heavenly position, but no promise of an earthly position. Okay? So God deals differently throughout history. It's called progressive revelation. It's called studying the Bible, what we call dispensationally. Okay, as Paul says, the dispensation of grace was given to me in Ephesians 3, verse 2. 
And so when we're talking about the spirit, we can't just say, oh, there's the spirit. He does the same thing. He's like a machine. It's like a pill you take. And once you take the spirit, you're going to do the same thing. Saul didn't speak in tongues as, that we know of, right? We see that he prophesied. We see the spirit has power and gives power and anoints people with power, especially in Israel's history. But the spirit left people in Israel's history because of their sin. Today, in the dispensation of God's grace, you're saved by God's grace. And look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. I hope I don't go the whole hour on this. I really need to get the tongues, you know. Ephesians chapter 1. It's just important we get this, because this, this is the main reason why people think the church began at Pentecost. It's because they see the Holy Spirit show up. Okay? But the Holy Spirit showed up many times before. And we need to know why he's showing up here. For what purpose is he showing up? Okay, because that's why we, what we need to ask in time past, what we need to ask at Pentecost, and what we need to ask now. How do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Is it because you speak in tongues? There's a lot of churches that teach that. That the, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in you is your speaking in tongues based on Acts 2. Ephesians 1.13, look at this. It says, in whom ye also trusted. The in whom, the whom there is Christ, based on verse 12. In Christ, ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Okay, in whom also after ye believed. So the order of events here in verse 13 is that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed it, you trusted it. And then at the end of the verse it says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You hear the gospel of your salvation, you trust it, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what happens to you. And there's no, in this verse, there's no indication physically or experientially that the Spirit has come upon you. He's sealing you. That, that sealing of the Holy Spirit is a promise that you have that when you trust the gospel, you are in the body of Christ, Romans 6 says. Okay. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 30. You know what is possible today that was not possible with Saul? That you could grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay. Saul, did, he, the Holy Spirit was upon Saul. He sinned. Why didn't the Holy Spirit say, Saul, you shouldn't do that, you know, but we're going we're gonna to fight it out. You know, didn't happen. Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul says that, uh, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed there. The Holy Spirit's ministry today is to seal those who trust and believe the gospel of the grace of God, salvation not by what you do, but what Christ did, is to seal those people to the day of redemption. That's his duty. And he will do that. He does not fail at it. Okay? You, however, the sinner who needs salvation by grace, you hear the gospel of grace and trust it, uh, you can sin and thus grieve the one sealing you to that day. Right? He doesn't leave you. So you see there's a different operation of the Spirit today where he does not leave you and back with Saul where he left, leaves him. He, he leaves people. He left Samson. It says the Spirit, you go back and read Judges 15, the Spirit left him. The Lord left him because of a sin, okay? So a different operation. So we need to ask, what is the Spirit doing? What is he saying? The Spirit's a teacher in the Scripture. The Spirit provides power in the Scripture. What is he saying? In John 15, 26, Jesus Christ said, before he uh, died and resurrected, before he sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he said, when the Comforter comes, he will testify of me. He will speak of me, is what he said. Okay, which is interesting. Okay, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit in the third person. He will speak of me. Two people, right? And when he comes, he will speak of me, in John 15, 26, which means the Spirit will preach Christ. He will not preach himself. And yet, how often do we get, in many charismatic circles, that we're missing and neglecting that third person of the Spirit as if he's being left out? You know, we're, we're leaving that one out. And we praise God the Father, and we praise Jesus Christ, but we never really praise the Spirit. That's because we're not supposed to. He speaks of Christ, you see. And as soon as you start praising the Spirit over and above Christ, you have neglected what we're supposed to do is glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And all knees bow to Him, you see. And so there, there's, a, there's a, a way the Bible instructs us in John 15, 26 of what the Spirit's going to do. Now, when Jesus says, the Spirit speaks of me, and I know you're going to say I'm splitting the hairs here, but I really don't think I am. That the question we need to ask is, well, how is He speaking of Jesus? Right? How is He speaking of Him? Because there's more than one way to preach Jesus Christ. We should know that by evidence of the Muslims, for example, or the Roman Catholics when the Pope stood in front of Congress this last week and not once mentioned the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I pointed that out in my article a couple of days ago, but I know the Pope speaks about Jesus Christ in other places. 
I know he writes about Jesus Christ. But would he say the same thing about Jesus Christ as you and I would say? The answer would be no. Muslims talk about Jesus Christ. Blessed be his name, they say. Right? But do they preach in the same way that we do? No. There are different ways to preach Jesus Christ, you see. And not only among people who believe different things about Jesus Christ, but in the Bible itself. You can preach Jesus Christ according to the prophets. And what the prophets spoke of, about Jesus Christ. How they prophesied his birth. And they prophesied he would be the king. Prophesied that he would die for Israel. Prophesied that he would be that shepherd of the sheep. You can study and preach Jesus Christ that way. Or, if you look at Romans 16, 25, you can preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Okay, and so Romans 16, 25, Paul says he has a gospel of Jesus Christ that was not known by the prophets. And that gospel is not that he's preaching a different Jesus, it's the same Jesus, but it's Jesus preached to all men. You know, Jesus was prophesied only to come to Israel. He was Israel's Messiah, Israel's king. He was Israel's savior, and none else, is what Isaiah says. But according to the mystery, Jesus is now preached to all. Without distinction, Jew or Gentile, you can all be saved, because you, you're all sinners, you're all counted in sin, and you need Jesus Christ's finished work to save you. That's how he's preached today. Okay. What we'll see next week and the week after is that what Peter preaches Jesus Christ in Acts 2, he preaches Jesus Christ according to prophecy. And not once does he preach him the way that Paul preaches Christ according to the mystery. So I bring this up just to show that it's important that we make these distinctions to know what God is saying, what he's doing, and at what time. We can't just, just, just willy-nilly blend everything together. Okay. And so when we talk about the Spirit and the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, we need to ask, well, what's he doing? What's he going to be teaching? We'll, we'll study what he's going to be teaching, what, he, what words he gives the apostles next week. Okay? But we need to bring that up. The Spirit does not leave us today. We're sealed by the Spirit. The work of the Spirit today in you is in giving you the mind of Christ. The Spirit's work at Pentecost was to give them utterance in tongue language, give them power to prophesy, to give them the power to heal, to give them the power to drink deadly things and pick up serpents, Mark 16, 17, and 18. That was what he was doing then as these people were expecting to go through the tribulation. For more on that, go back to our Sunday lesson where we're talking about the time that, that thing. Peter taught it was the last days. Okay. What they did not know in Acts 2 and what was revealed later was that all of that prophecy is now postponed, it's on hold, has been interrupted by the revelation of Jesus Christ according to, according to the mystery. Okay. And what the Spirit's doing today in you, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, is making known Christ according to the mystery, making known the mind of Christ in a new creature called the body of Christ, the church. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 says, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And so we study God's word, we rightly divide it, and we learn from the Spirit's inspired words in the Bible what he has done for us and who he's made us. And we learn, 1 Corinthians 2, verse uh, 16, the mind of Christ. That's not something they could know according to prophecy. Okay? We know that because of chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2 says in verse 10, or verse 9 rather, the prophet said, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's a prophecy. Okay, verse 10 is not in prophecy. That's something Paul says. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. We now know things that, according to prophecy, no one else could know. Right? And we've had it in the Bible. And, and this is going to be the issue as we talk about the tongues here. The issue is going to be that I've never found a tongue talker, and you help me. I've never found a tongue talker who understands the revelation of the mystery. And that's a problem. Okay, I've read articles from Charisma Magazine. I've read the, the books about how to speak in tongues and, and why they're speaking in tongues and what they're saying when they speak in tongues. And they always say they're explaining God's will or they're praising God or they're doing it to edify the Lord. And yet, I know the Lord's will today, according to the mystery. Ephesians 1 verse 9, 2 Timothy 1 verse 4. I know how to edify what God's doing today, the church, the body of Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 through 20. So there's things that I know that Pentecostals and tongue talkers claim they don't, and they need tongue talking to get it. You see? You see the difference? That, that, that's just the beginning. We're going to deal with more tongue talking here in a second. But. 
R right. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, is that th at Pentecost, they did not yet have the revelation of the mystery. They didn't have this information. Okay. So th the Holy Ghost has different ministries. He has different operations. He operated differently in time past than he does now. And we need to m make sure that we understand there's a difference there. Okay, and we'll see that as we go through Acts 2, verse by verse. Now, in Acts 2, verse 4, let's deal with the, the elephant in the room in this chapter, which is the tongue talking. Okay, in Acts 2, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, it was the Spirit that was doing this. Okay, it was God giving them this power to speak in tongues. And it was the Spirit we saw last week, which I won't go into again. It was the Spirit that was giving them the words to say. In Luke 21, in Luke 11, Jesus says, don't even think about what you're going to say. The Spirit will tell you what to say in that hour. And that's what's going on in Acts 2. The Spirit's giving them the power. So I, I take the Bible literally. I believe every word of the Bible, just as it's written. I believe in the ability for the Spirit-given, tongue-talking power in Acts 2 at Pentecost. I totally believe that is possible and that happens. I believe that. Okay? It says it very clearly right there. The Spirit gave them utterance. They speak in tongues. And it goes on to describe... Uh, that activity. I believe it, right? But as I mentioned before, uh, I've never met a tongue talker, never met a Pentecostal who knows the mystery of Christ. Every tongue talker I've read about or heard about or promotes it is ignorant of the revelation of the mystery, okay? Paul was neither saved at Pentecost, so he's not a Pentecostal, neither was he ignorant of the mystery of Christ because it was revealed to him, okay? We'll deal with Paul speaking in tongues here in a bit. And so I have an article on the website. You can type in tongues on the Grace Ambassadors website and find a whole slew of articles and resources talking about this. We are not, we're not scared of dealing with this. It's not something we, we wish to avoid. In fact, it would be great, as Paul says, if we all had the ability to speak in tongues, right? But God's not going to give it to me. The Spirit's not going to give me the, the ability to speak in tongues because, uh, we'll study later, why he did it at Pentecost. The reason why he did it at Pentecost is the same reason why he's not doing it now. Okay. If you don't know why he did it at Pentecost, that's why you don't know why he's not doing it now. Okay? So that's what we're going to cover here. The Pentecostals have really perverted the true meaning of what happened here at Pentecost. Oh, yeah. They think this is the pattern of the church, and so far we haven't found the church anywhere in Acts chapter 1 or verse chapter 2 yet. Okay? And they've really perverted what he's doing here. They think this is the, the new operation. We've already seen the Holy Spirit's power is an old thing, actually. This is just the only thing new is that it comes on all of them. Right? We've also seen everything happening here is according to prophecy. It's, it's something that was spoken since the world began. So it's not talking about the church. All right? And so what's really happening here when they're speaking in tongues? What's going on? What is this a sign of? Is this, are they supposed to just see people speaking in languages here and suddenly say, well, you've got something going on. I need to believe you. I mean, I mentioned, I think it was Sunday I mentioned this, that um, I mentioned on previous lessons. You know, Christians aren't the only ones that speak in tongues, that claim to speak in tongues, right? Christians aren't the only ones. Hindus claim to do it. Right? Tribal religions claim to do it. Catholics claim to do it. Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement did it. The Pope endorsed it. Right? Which should cause us pause. Because are these people saved? And we're not their judge to know if anyone individually is saved. But we do know if they preach a wrong gospel, and if you don't know the gospel, then why in the world would you have the power of the Spirit, which Pentecostals claim is the second blessing, the first one, salvation, right? But how can that be upon Hindus and tribal religions and Catholics who preach a gospel of works? How can that be that they claim the same thing? That Pentecostals are really in a quandary today because they claim to be the largest segment of Christianity, and by their numbers they are, four or five hundred million people worldwide. But you know who they include in that? Catholics. Anybody who will claim the powers of the Spirit. Okay, the third wave, and they're talking about the fourth wave coming. You know, anybody that will claim the charismatic powers, what are they preaching about the gospel? Well, that's secondary to the belief in the powers of the Spirit. Okay? Because a lot of folks are teaching a wrong gospel, and that's the main issue that I, wa I want to bring up an extra two here. It's not the tongue talking and that you're against the tongue talking or for the tongue talking. It's the gospel which is or isn't there. Okay? If every tongue talker would speak in tongues of the nations of the world and they would preach the gospel of the grace of God in the revelation of the mystery of Christ Jesus, amen, I'm all for him, let's go do it. I've never heard it happen anywhere that that happens. Okay? And that's the issue. Okay? You say, well, you don't believe in the power of the Spirit. I do believe in it. When I can heal, I've got it. Great, go heal and preach the gospel, the right one. You know, but they never do. John Hagee preaches a gospel of works. He preaches the cross, then adds to the cross what you have to do and what you shouldn't do, or else you'll lose God's blessing on you. 
That's Old Testament works-based doctrine. The gospel of God's grace is you have salvation freely through what Christ did. So that's the, that's the main issue here with the tongues. What we do know in Acts chapter 2 is that there's not a Christian in the whole chapter. And I say that by the authority of the Bible. Okay, Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it says they were first called Christians in Antioch. That was years after Pentecost, which is in a Jewish city of Jerusalem, far away from Antioch. They were not called Christians here. Everyone here was a Jew. Peter calls them Jews, identifies them as Jews. There's not a Christian here in name, is what I mean. Okay, were there followers of Christ? Yes, there were. So I don't want to play semantic games there. There's no Christian here, and neither is there any unknown tongue in this chapter. Every tongue they speak in Acts chapter 2 is known by people present. There's not a single unknown tongue in this chapter. Okay? The only proof of so-called angelic or unknown tongues in the Bible that Pentecostals grab is from Paul's verse in Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And we can cover that, and we can deal with that question if you have it, but we're studying Acts 2 tonight. We've got verse by verse on 1 Corinthians online. Acts chapter 2, there's not an unknown tongue in this chapter. Okay? And so if God's intent in Acts 2 was to give a prayer language which no one understands for them to praise and edify God, then how come everything they say here is understood by everyone else and what they're saying is not to God but to men? Right? So it cannot be that here. Okay? It cannot be that in Acts 2. That's not the purpose of what's going on here. All right. Look at Acts 2 down in verse uh, 5. There were dwelling at Jerusalem. Now they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there was dwelling at Jerusalem who... Jews. Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel. We saw a couple weeks ago, there's a reason why they were in Jerusalem. It's not because they lived there. Okay? It was because Jesus told them to stay there. Because according to prophecy, salvation had to come to the world through Israel, starting with Jerusalem, then Judea, the two southern tribes, then Samaria, the ten northern tribes, and then when Israel was saved, salvation would come to the nations of the world through them. That was prophecy. That was kingdom. So they had to be in Jerusalem. It was only in Jerusalem the Holy Ghost came. You know that from Acts 19. Acts 19, there were Jews walking around out of Jerusalem. They didn't yet have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost only came down in Jerusalem. Okay, to these Jews, these 12 apostles, these people in, in the room here who uh, had waited according to prophecy for this gift. That's right. Yep. So in, in verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. That's going to be important here in a bit. So there were Jews from every nation, or from all these nations, but they were Jews in Jerusalem coming back for what reason? Well, Pentecost. There's a, there's a hol holiday here. <laughs> there's, there, every male in, uh, that was a Jew was supposed to come back to, to, to Jerusalem if they could to observe Pentecost. And so they were there, every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Notice the word confounded. We'll get to that here in a bit. But that's an important word. They're confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. In his own language. So people who were born in other nations or from other nations spoke the languages of those nations, even though they were Jews in the flesh. And what they heard these people speaking was their own language. It's very clearly. I believe the Bible literally. They heard them speak their own language, which was a miracle for these fishermen who never went to a language school in their life. Right? So they heard them speak their own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? These aren't educated men. They're Galileans. There's kind of a mock in there. You know, they're from Galilee. You know. It's like saying they're from Swayze. You know? It's like a mock. Can these guys from Swayze have anything, right? I mean, people kind of mock that. Right? They're, they're from Galilee. And how hear we every man in our own tongue? So you see, these people are hearing words in their own tongue. They understand what's being said. This is not things that they cannot understand. These are things they understand. So speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 is languages that people understand. That's what it is. And the power there, the miraculous ability, was that these Galileans could not speak multiple languages. They could only speak one. And they could only speak you know, what they spoke naturally. But the Holy Ghost gave them the power to when they uttered, and he gave them the words to utter, that they uttered other languages. And these other people heard them. And it says, uh, verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. You count the number of places there, there's more, more, there's more places and tongues than there are 12 apostles. Some people have said that means perhaps the miracle was in the hearing and not the speaking. I don't know, it doesn't say. 
Some people say that means that all 120 of them spoke in tongues. Okay, maybe. It could also mean that maybe they were preaching multiple messages. Whatever the case, there's many nations here, many languages, and they all heard them in their own language, their own tongue. Okay, what a miracle. Speaking in tongues is real. It's something that God does. It's something that God did. Right. You also notice as an interesting side note here that the nations represented here in verses 9 through 11, and, uh, 11 are some of the same nations you see that Peter writes to in 1 Peter chapter 1. So as we've, asked, as we've dealt before with how to study the books of the Bible, and we say that an important thing to ask when studying the books is who wrote it and to whom did they write it? Well, in 1 Peter, Peter being an epistle written to Jews scattered from Jerusalem, he identifies in 1 Peter 1 the strangers in these nations right here. That tells you where 1 Peter was written to. Okay, so that's a good cross-reference right there. 1 Peter 1, it mentions Pontus and, and Cappadocia and these places. So he's writing to those Jews. Also interesting to note is that there's strangers of Rome here. Paul writes the book of Romans. And it seems like in the book of Romans, he's writing to people there who had heard about Jesus Christ, not from him. Right? Well, that means they heard it from Peter. Strangers of Rome in Jerusalem. Okay, and maybe they left with the knowledge of what Peter preached. All right, so just, just a thought there. There were Jews and their proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles who became Jews by converting into Judaism, okay? All the people here were Jews or proselytes to Judaism. Okay, there's not a Gentile in the audience. As we see Peter say in verse 14, you men of Judea, all you that dwell in Jerusalem. And later in the chapter, he says to the, the men of Israel, right, who he addresses the, the preaching to. He, he addresses specifically the men of Israel. Okay, so it's interesting. What we have here is a Pentecostal a Jewish holiday happening. And on this holiday, the fulfillment of the holiday happens. The Holy Ghost allows them to speak in languages. Everyone hears the languages, and they're amazed, and they're confounded by what's going on here. And it says in verse 11, the Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Okay, now that's an important phrase there, wonderful works of God in verse 11, because if you want to know what they're saying here, that's going to be important. Now, we're going to find out next week what Peter actually says whilst recording the scripture. But John Wesley, in his commentary, says probably those wonderful works that they were speaking about there in verse 11 were uh, the miracles, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, together with the coming of the Spirit as the fulfillment of his promises and the glorious dispensation of the grace of God. So John Wesley says what they were preaching was the same gospel you preach, the dispensation of the grace of God, the wonderful works of Christ according to the mystery. Okay, but I beg the dipper, because as we'll see next week and the week after, you don't find anything in Peter's message about him knowing the revelation of the mystery which Christ had not yet revealed to Paul. Okay, so how, how do we know what they were saying? What are these wonderful works of Christ? Well, what's the amazing thing about your King James Bible is you can find phrases in the Bible that will give you great cross-references. If we have a, a concordance, or better, a software program, you can look up that phrase, wonderful works. And you say, really? Is it that easy? <laughs> Apparently, it is in some cases. You look up the phrase wonderful works, and you get an amazing set of cross-references. I got them listed on your outline there. I don't want to go back and study them all, but I'll give you some hint. You can do it on your own. It's a really fascinating study. In all of these chapters in the book of Psalms, you'll find that phrase, wonderful works. Psalm 40 talks about how um, he would come speaking in parables, which is a cross-reference to Jesus' ministry where he spoke in parables. And it goes on to describe uh, what the Messiah would do. In fact, Psalm 40 is quoted in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews being an epistle written to these guys in Acts 2, right? Jews, Hebrews. And so Hebrews starts quoting Psalm 40 and says, this is what Jesus came to do, right? So wonderful works that God was doing in Israel, in Jesus Christ, in the Messiah. In Psalm 78, verse 4, very long chapter there, talks about wonderful works. And what an amazing thing that is, it follows the wonderful works in Psalm 78 4 with the commandments that God gave to Israel and the law. And it goes through all of the miraculous, wonderful works that God had performed in Israel and how they needed to be reminded of these things and how no matter how much they rejected the God of Israel that did these wonderful works, God always came back and showed them mercy. Which is an amazing cross-reference to Acts 2. Because these people just crucified their Messiah. And what's the message Peter's going to preach? but he's offering you salvation. Repent. Even though you rejected the God of works and miracles that he did with you, he's offering you one, a chance and a salvation. That's what Psalm 78 deals with. It goes through all those times in Israel's past where he did the, the miracles, did the powers, and Israel rejected him. 
But God didn't cast him away. He came back and, and gave him some more. And they rejected him. Came back and did some more. It almost reads like Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. So do your own study on, on Psalm 78. It's an amazing thing. Psalm 107 is fascinating. You may not know this, but remember when Jesus walked on, or uh, didn't walk in the water, but he calmed the waters. Remember that? When he's in the boat and he's with the ministry. He's sleeping there and the waves are crashing and the disciples are afraid they're going to die. And, and he wakes up and calms the seas and they say, wow, what man is this? They marveled, right? They were amazed. So that's a, that's a fulfillment of prophecy, in case you didn't know. Everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry fulfilled prophecy. In Psalm 107, uh, between verses 21 and 31, which mentioned the wonderful works of God, okay, is this prophecy about him calming the storm and, and, and commanding the seas. And it talks about that being a wonderful work of God. I wonder what they were preaching in Acts chapter 2. Probably Psalm 107. Here's a man that calmed the seas, that calmed the waters, like Psalm 107 said. I wouldn't be surprised if they were just reading Psalm 107, like, you know, they were uttering it. And the Holy Ghost giving them these words to start preaching Psalm 107, Psalm 78, and they're going, wow, that speaks of Jesus? Right? Psalm 111 is a similar thing. We're all over that chapter. It deals with the wonderful works of God and how they need to return to the covenant, how God will give covenant and mercy to his people. Right? So, so, like I said, interesting cross-references there when you just look up that phrase, wonderful works of God, and all deal with the, 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 the very same doctrinal issues that Peter's going to talk about regarding Israel. has nothing to do with the church, has everything to do with God's fulfillment of his promises and his prophecies to Israel. Right? And when we make that cross-reference, it's an amazing understanding that we get, grasp from that. So, back to Acts chapter 2. Do your own study on that. I don't have time to cover all those verses tonight. But in Acts chapter 2, down in verse 12. These people are speaking in tongues to all these nations, uh, Jews from these nations. And they were all amazed, in verse 12, and were in doubt. They were in doubt. They heard these wonderful works of God. They heard them talking about these, this prophetic fulfillment and the works that God had done. And they're going, what? And he says, what means this? What is the meaning of this? Which I think is an amazingly appropriate question because it's right in the middle of the chapter that the church asks itself. It's been asking itself for the last 2,000 years. What in the world's happening in Acts chapter 2? What is going on? Tongue talking. And it's been the plague of all sorts of uh, false teaching and doctrine about what's going on here. Everything from this being a sign of salvation, which can't be true because these people were already promised salvation before the tongues came, okay? To it being the sign of a second blessing of the Spirit. And so you don't have everything God's given you until you get the Holy Spirit baptism, which can't be true because Ephesians 1 13 says you have the Spirit once you believe. Right? You're already baptized with the Spirit into Christ. And the third thing that, that, that's wrongly taught is that the very presence of the Spirit begins at Pentecost. And, and we've seen already, that's happened already before in the Bible. He's been there before. All these wrong teachings, by the way, I just mentioned, that whether it be the sign of salvation, the second blessing, or the, uh, the Spirit's very presence in you requiring tongue talking, these are all cured by a study of 1 Corinthians. Okay? The Corinthians were the most carnal church in Paul's ministry. All the wrong behaviors and the sins they committed prove that you do not have to be the holiest person for the Spirit to use you and speak in tongues. And neither were these people at Pentecost more spiritual because they received tongues, the power to speak in tongues. It was because that's what God was doing at the time. It's not because they had some sort of greater spirituality, right? So waiting for a second blessing, praying for a second blessing, why should he bless you again? Especially when we know, Ephesians 1, 3, God to you has given you all spiritual blessings. And Colossians 2, verse 10 says, you are complete in Christ. If you're complete in Christ, what are you lacking? And if you answer anything, you're wrong, you're complete in Christ, is what the verse says. You're not lacking anything in him, you see. In Acts 2, these people were not preaching the gospel of being complete in Christ. They were preaching the fulfillment of prophecy. And prophecy had not yet been fulfilled. And to fulfill prophecy, you need the Holy Ghost to come. You need the powers to be performed, the tribulation to happen, the kingdom to come. There's things that had to happen. Okay? In this dispensation of grace, everything has happened already for you. Christ has already died. He's already resurrected. He's already offered salvation freely. You trust that gospel. And it's all done for you. That's it. You're complete in Christ. You say, we don't have to do anything. Not for salvation, you don't. Not to receive the Spirit, you don't. Not to receive all spiritual blessings, you don't. Not to receive your position in heavenly places, you don't. That's, all, that's called the dispensation of grace. Grace is what God does, not what you do. You see? And so that, that's very different what we're seeing here in Acts 2. Okay? 
So uh, tongues. What is the purpose of tongues then, Justin? You keep saying that you know, there's a purpose for this and why this is happening here and you believe that this is a real thing happening, then what is it? Okay. But what was the purpose then at Pentecost? What was it? Well, the, the gift of tongues was given for clear communication, which I find laughable because that is exactly the opposite of what people think tongues are for today. In fact, many, much of the church is confused by this whole tongue talking thing. It, should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we expect to do it? What, what's the deal? They're all confused by this, right? And yet the gift of tongues was given not for confusion. It's in the very chapter that Paul deals with tongue talking when he says God is not the author of confusion. In which he says that if, you, if any of you be spiritual or a prophet, let him confirm, let him acknowledge that what I say, I being Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, is the commandments of the Lord. So that's a pretty good test even today. If anybody be spiritual or claims to be a prophet or an apostle, let them acknowledge what Paul says is the commandments of the Lord. If they do not acknowledge the revelation of the mystery of Christ, the fellowship of the mystery, then they have some things missing. They are ignorant. Here's what Paul says. He says, let the ignorant be ignorant if they're ignorant of that. Okay? And that's what we find, unfortunately. It's, it's our duty to make all men see, Ephesians 3, verse 9, the fellowship of the mystery. To make things clear, the manifold wisdom of God. Okay? It's the revelation of the mystery. It's not a mystery still a mystery. It's the revelation of it, you see. So we're to make these things clear. Tongues is not for confusion. It's not to hide communication. It's not for people not to understand. It's not your private language that no one else can interpret. It's not it. It's, it, the purpose is for clear communication and better understanding, which is why Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 14 that if your tongue talking does not result in better understanding, stop it. In 1 Corinthians 14, 19, Paul says, I'd rather speak five words of my own understanding, of, of, of understanding among the, in the church, than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. He says it to tongue talkers. It, it's very hard to speak 10,000 words in an hour. I'm trying, I keep trying every week, you know, but it's very hard, 10,000 words in an hour. So you got a whole sermon preached in another language or five words, Christ died for your sins, rather that you prophesy. Those, those 10 words, two different five word phrases, right? You've gotten more out of that than a whole 30 minutes of tongue talking, according to what Paul says, right? Unless your tongue talking helps understand. My wife speaks Chinese. I keep using her as an example. She's a great living example. But if there were people here who could not understand English, and they're just sitting there, and they don't understand English, I'm not doing them any good at all. We need someone to speak their language. Right? We need people to speak the language. That's why I said before, we would love to have tongue talkers. It'd be great if they actually did the tongues as they were intended to be done. But what we do know is what was going on at Pentecost is not going on today for the purpose that it was given. Tongues were given for better communication, clearer communication. In Acts 2, the tongues were given here in fulfillment of prophecy. In Mark 16, 17, it says, These signs will follow them that believe. And it lists among those, they'll speak in new tongues, right? New languages. And it also listed in there, by the way, which you cannot segregate. Okay, the power to heal, the power to drink deadly things, the power to pick up serpents. You can't just pick one or two, you got to take all of them. We covered on Sunday that all those things were given to people who are going to go through those, those events in Revelation, in the tribulation, that were going to come upon the earth and Israel. Those would be powers they needed then. Okay? That's what was going on in Acts 2. All right? Meanwhile, uh, it was something Mark 16, 17 said would happen. But again, why? Why did Mark say this would happen in the last days? Why, as we'll see, did the prophets say that in the last days they'll speak in tongues? Did you know that? Did you know the prophets said that they would speak in tongues in the last days? That they would speak in the languages of all the nations in the last days? But they did. The prophets said that. Look at Isaiah 28. Look at Isaiah 28. I want to get through these, these verses here. This is so important. This is the, hopefully, the, the, the most important thing we can learn about tongues to, in tonight's lesson, as well as coming up, coming up in the next 10 or 15 minutes here. Understand that God never, in, how do I say this? God never intended the world to be like it is right now. There are nations all over the world speaking different languages. We cannot understand each other, okay? There's confusion in the church. <laughs> We're speaking the same language, right? God did not intend that. He's not the author of confusion. He did not create the world to be a confusing place. How did it get that way? That would be sin's fault. That would be man's fault, right? It's sin entered, and we learn that in Genesis. Isaiah 28, look at verse 11. Isaiah 28, verse 11. 
Now this is a prophecy that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. There's right there. There's another tongue speaking to who's to this people? In this chapter, it's going to be Israel. In this chapter, we'll see it's about Israel and how they, they rejected God's instructions. And as a result, God says, because you rejected my instructions, I will speak to you with people with another tongue. Right? Paul quotes that in 1 Corinthians 14. Why does Paul quote that in 1 Corinthians 14 about tongues? Because when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14 about tongues, Israel had rejected Peter's message by that time. Okay, Peter, uh, Israel had rejected the Holy Spirit and the tongues at Pentecost. And so what happened? Gentiles start speaking in tongues. Gentiles, people of another nation, another tongue start speaking to them. And oh, they hate that. That's Isaiah 28, 11. And Paul says it's just, that's what it is right there. Tongues are a sign, a sign to unbelieving people is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Tongues are not for believers, Paul says. They're for unbelievers. Which is why if you speak in tongues, you need to get out of the church and speak in tongues to people that can understand your tongue because it's for unbelievers to hear the gospel, not for believers. Okay. And Isaiah 28 is the verse that Paul uses to prove that. Israel is the one in unbelief in Isaiah 28. And God said that I will send people of another tongue to speak to you with stammering lips. Right? And that's, that's a prophecy. Look at Isaiah 30. Too. But that's, that's Paul. That's Paul. That's Israel's fall. What about Pentecost? What's going on there? I mean, Israel hasn't fallen yet. At Pentecost, is, they're still preaching kingdom come through Israel. They're preaching in Jerusalem to Jews. Well, look at Isaiah 32 in verse 4. Here in verse 1, it says, A king shall reign in righteousness. A prince, uh, princess shall rule in judgment. Okay. Verse 3, the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. That means they won't be blind anymore. The ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also the rash shall understand knowledge. And the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. Apparently, in this time when the blind see and the deaf will hear is also the time when people will speak plainly. The tongues will not be confused. They won't be stammered anymore, it says in Isaiah 32. Look at Isaiah 35, verse 5. Isaiah 35, verse 5. Again, another chapter here talking about the rise of Israel, the rise of Zion, the coming of the kingdom. And it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then shall the lame man leap as a heart. That's a direct fulfillment in Acts chapter 3, when Peter preaches to the lame man and heals him. And it says, And the tongue of the dumb sing. The tongue of the dumb. Those who cannot speak will sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. I'm showing you a few verses here that show that part of God's restoration of the earth in the kingdom was that the sicknesses, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and people will speak with the language that we all understand. Okay? Is, is, what, is what the prophecy said. The parched ground shall be like a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. The habitations of dragons will have grass. The world will be restored to how God wanted it to be and better according to prophecy, okay? I mean, no more death, no more pain, no more tears. This is God's end goal, right? This is the hope of salvation. Now, let's go back to Genesis 11. To understand God's restoration in the kingdom, we have to understand why it needs to be restored in the first place. If God sent the Holy Ghost down and gave these guys, these Jews, going to a kingdom, the power to speak in the languages of people that can understand each other, why did they have to do that? What was that a sign of? Well, Genesis 11. This chapter speaks about a place called Babel. The word Babel means confusion, right? It's called that because it's here where the languages of the world were created by God as punishment for the whole world when God instructed them to spread out across the world and they didn't. In rebellion against God, they gathered together and built a tower to heaven. God didn't want them to go to heaven. And he said, we're going to confound their language. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 9, Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence the Lord did scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the nations were separated according to languages when God confounded them as a result of their disobedience to him. Okay, that's when the languages were created. And so we see this diversity of language 
being a form of punishment. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah 5. In Israel's history, even, when they disobeyed God, God said, I will bring people to you, as we saw in Isaiah 28, who speak a different language. In Jeremiah 5, verse 15, he says a similar thing. In Jeremiah 5, verse 15. God confounded the language. That's interesting. He confounded the language in response to man's disobedience. Jeremiah 5, verse 15. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understands what they say. Part of Israel's punishment in Jeremiah 5 is that another nation that speaks a language you don't will come and rule over you. And there's nothing worse than that. I mean... It's one thing to be slaves to someone else. You don't know what they're even saying. Now you seem like a barbarian, which is a word talking about languages. You don't speak the same language. I don't even understand what they're saying. Okay? Language was used from Genesis 11 on, diversity of languages, as a punishment. The fact that people claim today that God's given me the power to speak in 50 different languages puffs up humanity. And it says nothing to what God was doing at Pentecost. When God confused languages and brought other languages in the Old Testament, it was always as a result of punishment. Okay? You know how the world sees the ability to speak in other languages? They see this as kind of like a, um, this is the greatest skill in humanity, speaking languages. If I told you I can speak 15 languages fluently, what would you think of me immediately? That's, that's a smart guy. He's a brilliant man. Right? Just, just, if I spoke two languages fluently, you'd think I was smarter than I was. Right? But 15 languages, that's the smartest man on earth, probably. Never mind that speaking languages says nothing about your ability to be wise or speak the truth or know anything about science or philosophy or anything. You're just speaking languages. But that's what humanity thinks. That if we can just bring the world languages together, which is an amazing thing, because the Bible, God confounded the language. He's the one that did that. It's almost as if people think that if we can get rid of that curse, if we can get rid of the curse that God put on us, then we can save ourselves. That sounds like humanity, <laughs> right? The point here being that when God confounded the languages in Genesis 11, it was a punishment on the earth. When God would bring nations that speak other languages to Israel, it was a punishment to them, okay? And in the same, in the same vein, if we look at um, Zephaniah chapter 3, is this the second time in a week I've gone to Zephaniah? I think so. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah, if you go to Matthew in your Bible and just turn left about seven or eight pages, you'll get to Zephaniah. I can just read it to you. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Talking about the kingdom come to Israel, God says, Then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. That sounds a lot like the opposite of Babel, where they with one voice and one consent disobeyed God. <laughs> and God says, there'll be a time when the kingdom comes where they with one voice and one consent obey me, you see. And so what we have at Pentecost is the fulfillment of these prophecies, the restoration of languages at a time when the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. God's kingdom is going to be fulfilled. It's going to come to earth. Israel's being preached to in Israel's capital city. And the power of the Holy Ghost is given so that they can be restored to one language, preaching to all men to call upon the name of the Lord. And everyone in all their nations understood what they were saying, and they were marveling at it. That's what's going on here. The restoration of God's kingdom on the earth. And that's what the sign of speaking in tongues was in Acts 2. Okay, was just that. Look at Acts 2. I told you in Acts 2 earlier, in verse 5 and 6, to notice that word, confounded. Remember Genesis 11, the word that God used back there, when he confounded their languages in punishment? In Acts 2, 5 and 6, there were Jews of every nation under heaven, just like there was every nation under heaven back in Genesis 11. In verse 6, it says, they were confounded when they heard every man speak in his own language. Suddenly, the confounding here isn't because, oh, we can't understand each other. Babel, Babylon, right? Now it's, we can all understand, we can understand each other. We, we, all, we all understand what's going on. We, we hear what they're saying in our own language. This is the return, the restoration of God's kingdom on the earth, okay? When you understand that and why that's going on there, then you'll understand why tongues, as they were happening at Pentecost, are not happening today. Because God is not today restoring his kingdom to the earth. 
we'll see in the chapters after Acts 2, when these guys, speaking in tongues, performing miracles, speaking in prophecies, spoke to Israel, that Israel rejected their preaching of the kingdom. They stoned Stephen. And instead of pouring out his wrath, as the prophet said would happen, God returned and gave his grace to the apostle Paul and says, before I return in wrath and judgment to set up my kingdom, I'm dispensing grace to the world. You're going to go preach to all nations salvation without Israel, without the law, freely by my grace. That's what he told Paul to do as a chosen vessel. And since God is no longer in this dispensation, he will in the future, but not now, restoring his kingdom on the earth, he is not then restoring the languages. So then why do people claim to speak in tongues? Because they, th they don't understand what I just described, the change of what God is doing. They think God is still doing what he was doing in Acts 2. They think that the gospel of the kingdom is still what they're supposed to preach. They preach that we're to build a kingdom today. And so they're trying to do what God was doing in Acts 2, but he's no longer doing. And that's why you see so much failure at it. <laughs> okay? Unfortunately. But you see, that was the purpose of tongues according to prophecy. The restoration of language. The tongues were for an unbeliever. The reason why Paul spoke in tongues was as a sign to unbelieving Israel that they were in unbelief. How did they know they were in unbelief? Because look at these Gentiles speaking in tongues to you. When the kingdom was no longer preached, when Israel was fallen, you never see another person speaking in tongues after Acts 28. Acts is the book about the fall of Israel, right? And, and Paul says in Acts 28 that Israel's rejected salvation. Salvation has gone to the Gentiles. And if salvation goes to the Gentiles without Israel, there's no kingdom, there's no fulfillment of prophecy, it is a mystery dispensation. And all the healings and miracles and prophecies and restoration of the earth, the grass from the desert, the raising from the dead, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the tongues will be loosed, all of this is no longer happening. It will in the future, praise God, it will. But today what God offers is his grace, his salvation to a world of sinners that's rejected him. Okay. Let's look at, look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse uh, 14. There's a place for tongues in your Bible. I think they happen just as the Bible said they happen. I think they will happen in the same way. But there's a reason why the church is divided and confused about it today. It's because God's not behind it. People are trying to do, and there's books written about how to do it. <laughs> they didn't need a book to describe to them how to do it. In fact, you know, the most descriptive place in your Bible that talks about tongues is when Paul is trying to get them to manage it, not teaching them how to do it. I've read books that explain how to speak in tongues. They say, just, just let your tongue kind of wobble. You know? just let, it, let it loose. Just whatever you find in bubbling inside, just let it out. Okay. Well, th that's not what the Spirit's doing today. The Spirit would give you the words to speak if what was going on at Pentecost is happening today. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, You desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy, in verse 1. Because why? Prophesy would be something that people can understand and it would help edify them. Okay, the whole point of chapter 14 here is that we're, our goal is to edify the church. However that be, if it be by your tongue talking, your prophesying, we need to edify the church according to the revelation of the mystery which is why Paul said, you need to acknowledge what I say. But down in verse 18, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, Paul says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. I, th I thank God, and I don't speak in tongues. Um, that's not a choice I make. <laughs> if God gave me the power, I'd do it, right? Paul had the power. He did it, speaking to Israel, ministering the gospel of the grace of God, okay? Ministering to unbelieving Israel as a sign to them. But Paul says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. And so this is often used as a, as a proof text. Say, well, you're Pauline. Paul spoke in tongues. But the sentence doesn't end in verse 18. Verse 19 is the end of the sentence. Paul says, yet in the church, I had rather speak only five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Okay, the church needs to be taught right doctrine. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9, Paul says, Christ had given him the dispensation of grace to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, which before was hidden God in Christ Jesus. Right? Ephesians 3, 8, he ordered to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Not the searchable riches, the tongues that were in prophecy, but the unsearchable riches. And if people don't understand those unsearchable riches, your complete position in Christ, the mind of Christ, who you are in Christ, what Christ has given you by his grace, then what are we doing? Preaching things and instructing people to do things that just add to the confusion, okay? Paul says, I'd rather speak five words in my own understanding than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. 
for the sake of the church, is what he's saying there, for the sake of people growing in the knowledge of the truth, which, by the way, is God's will, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Okay, so what I said in your outline there at the end is if you can't make all men see the fellowship of the mystery by your tongues, then your so-called gift is useless. It's useless. Make it useful if you claim to have it, but I've never met a tongue talker who understands the revelation of the mystery, and you'd be the first if you do it. Right? Paul always says there should be an interpreter. Why? So you can understand what's being said. Right? So hopefully that made things clearer than when we began. If not, let me know, ask your questions. I, I intend to make it clear. I don't intend to, to make it confusing. Any, any questions, any comments about that? Started. You're unclear now? No, I oh, okay. no, I'm <laughs> Well, we, we've covered tongues before a few times already, 1 Corinthians 14 and other places. So, yeah, it's, it's not a new thing. But I, I think understanding the, the prophetic purpose of what tongues and languages and prophecy understands why they were going on at Pentecost and, and, and then again why they're not going on now. All right, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We, we thank you for your power that uh, you have displayed in time past uh, through Israel and at Pentecost and your wonderful ability to do all ab above that we ask or think. The same power that works in us, Paul says, promises us resurrection and promises us eternal life and all spiritual blessings. And you give us a hope, a hope that's comforting, that though we can't see your uh, work in the world today as much, we know that you are working through your word and through those that are saved and through the gospel. And we walk by faith in that, not by sight. We thank you, Lord, for the understanding you provided for us and your word rightly divided. Amen. Thank you, folks. We'll pick it up in Acts 2 next week.